Welcome to our Advent One sermon for this Sunday uh, now afternoon. As we continue to work on our live streaming capacity, i uh, happy to report that today we're able to have video and sound streaming from the sanctuary. Uh, we have to take a next step now and improve our internet connectivity so that the end result isn't choppy. And so that's why I'm doing the sermon uh, via video uh, today. I want to welcome you to then uh, this time of worship and invite you to listen to the word of God within these words of scripture. People were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they sternly ordered them not to do it. But Jesus called for them and said, let the little children come to me and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. If God were nominated for an Oscar for her role in the Bible, would the Oscar category be for Best Actor, or is the category Best Supporting Actor? In which case, humans are the main character of the Bible, and God does the supporting. Now, I know, the Bible's primary revelation is God, and God is the primary actor. But the Bible also reveals humanity. And biblical passages, like the one we just read from Luke's Gospel, reveal something about both the kingdom of God and humanity. Specifically, that the kingdom of God belongs to childlike humans. The Christian calendar is filled with feast days that commemorate the lives of martyrs and saints, that celebrate the lives of exemplary humans whose lives reveal something about God and about us. And this past Monday was the feast day for Clements I, considered the first pope after Peter in the Catholic Church. Now, there's a legend about how Clement died. And the legend has it that Pope Clement was the first was martyred in a horrible way, in a manner revealing the cruel efficiencies of the Roman Empire. But then again, a death revealing and symbolizing Christ's triumph over Rome and all empires. The legend of Clement's death goes something like this. During the reign of Emperor Trajan, Clement was banished to Crimea, to a stone quarry, forced labor camp. And when he saw that the prisoners there were suffering, were dehydrated for lack of water, he knelt down to pray. And when he looked up, he saw a lamb on a hill. And so Clement took his pickaxe and struck the ground where the lamb was standing, and a spring of fresh water began to flow. Now, this miracle led the fellow prisoners and the local town folk to convert to Christianity. Now, that sounds like a happy ending, yeah, but not so much. Uh, Clement was punished. And as his punishment, he was sen sentenced to death, tied to an anchor and dumped into the Black Sea. Now, that's just the legend of his death. In his day, the Hollywood version of his martyrdom. But Clement loved legends, human legends. And he used them to teach theological truths to the people in his congregation. Take, for example, the legend of the phoenix. You're all familiar with it. It has different versions. And Clement would use the story of the phoenix to teach his congregation about the magnificence of God's promise of resurrection. A Clement's uh, version recalls the great phoenix, the legendary bird with a 500-year lifespan, um, getting ready for its death. In Clement's version of the legend, 
The bird builds its own coffin as it approaches death, a coffin made of frankincense, myrrh, and fragrant spices. Clement is rather graphic in his sermon illustration. He writes in his epistle, when the bird dies, a worm is born, nurtured by the dead bird's rotting corpse, growing wings and eventually carrying the bones of its dead parent to Egypt, to the altar of the sun, where the local priests mark time by it every 500 years. Now, Clement argues that if God brings about this bird's marvelous resurrection, then consider God's promise for those humans who live in holiness and assurance of faith. So if there's any truth to the legend of Clement's death, it would be that in the face of death, his assurance of salvation was anchored in Jesus Christ. Now, children love legends and folklore and fables, and these simple stories teach simple truths for human living. Maybe that's what Jesus means when he says, Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Or, maybe Jesus means that the kingdom of God is easy for children to enter because they are, unlike us adults, innocent, mostly, powerless, humbly virtuous, or maybe it's because children are just like sponges, ready to absorb love, and so ready to absorb God's love. That they're, they're just forming attachments. They're open to bonding with God. Or maybe what Jesus is saying is explained best for our time in history, where conspiracy theories can paralyze the democratic process in the most advanced empire in human history. Maybe being childlike means having a childlike immunity against the grand idiocy of our time, deception. A noted authority on deception, uh, magician James Randi, maybe you remember him uh, from back in the day, uh, he once said that cognitive sophisticates, that's the big word he used simply to mean adults who can think in a sophisticated way. Cognitive sophisticates, adults, are often easier to deceive than children. Randi explained, it's because that he explained that children are notoriously hard to fool because children don't know enough logic to be taken in by logic-defying tricks, which are the bread and butter, not only of the magician, but also of cult leaders who tend to ensnare rather cognitively sophisticated people uh, into the deception that they're weaving. In our day, just how odd it is that people who we think are cognitively sophisticated get ensnared by cult leaders. Lawyers, former mayors, governors. Jesus said, truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little unsophisticated child will never enter it. Let me use uh, Clement's use of the Phoenix story, or something like it, as a sermon illustration to explain our Bible study today. I'll, I'll translate what Jesus is saying into Star Wars legend. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a foundling will never enter it. The kingdom of God belongs to the foundlings, to the children. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm watching The Mandalorian on TV. And uh, even if you're not, that's okay. I'll explain it to you. The Mandalorian is the TV show with Baby Yoda. And if you're not familiar with the show, you probably at least know something about Star Wars and Yoda. And fans are excited this week because that child, that Baby Yoda's real name, 
got revealed, but I won't spoil it for you in case you're uh, wanting to watch the series. Now, if you're not familiar with the show, all you need to know is this, that uh, Din, Jardin, the, J Din Djarin, the Mandalorian, was orphaned as a child during the Republic era and raised as a foundling, as a child, by the children of the Watch, whom some people consider uh, a cult, who trained him to become a Mandalorian warrior. Now, if you follow that, uh, follow this. The Mandalorian, he never forgets that he was once a foundling, a child, rescued from the grips of an imperial war. And from this empathy and this compassion that he recalls when he thinks about his own childhood, he decides that he's going to rescue baby Yoda, who is in great danger. And while preparing his armor, this intergalactic gunslinger, this man of few words, tells his armorer, I was once a foundling. And he recalls his own childhood and its vulnerability and the grace and love of those who saved him. Now, Baby Yoda uh, looks more like a cute reptile than a, uh, a baby worm from the, the Phoenix uh, folklore. But like the Phoenix, Baby Yoda has a life expectancy of at least 500 years and was born out of the ashes of an imperial war. Baby Yoda is a foundling, a child, vulnerable but nascently powerful. The Mandalorian and Baby Yoda, they become emotionally attached. The Mandalorian says repeatedly, where the child goes, I go. And sure enough, the Mandalorian's life is being transformed in the going, in the going of where the child goes. I think that what Jesus is calling us to do is just like the following of the foundling. Jesus says, if you want to go where I go, then go where the child goes. Even if you have to drop anchor to follow, even if you have to die and be born again to new life to follow. Amen. Thanks for joining me and our congregation today online for our brief worship service. And may God bless you in the week to come. Amen.